Welcome to the October 17th school board work session. This is a public meeting that is videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV 7, a local cable station. During this meeting, we ask you to turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations outside the room. We will now stand to repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. Did you switch your phone to I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move that we amend the agenda to remove section 1.01, um, moving into closed session, and 1.02, discussing the handbook. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, any discussion about this? We just um, had some time constraints and we adjusted the agenda. And this motion reflects that. Roll call. So call for the vote to amend the agenda. All in favor? All in favor. We do roll call. Do roll call. Um, I will do the roll call. Uh, Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. And Ms. O'Connor? Yes. The agenda is amended as documented. We're moving right into our work. We'll move right into policy. No. I move. I move that we approve the agenda as amended. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion for the approval? No discussion. I um, roll call. call for roll call. Okay. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Captain Kelly? Yes. Yes. So, so then the agenda is amended. And the agenda has been amended. And we're moving forward. And we'll move forward into open session. Yes. So the first item on our agenda is policies. And so we needed to have some discussion with regard to policies. Um, um, uh, to our board members, I recognize that there have been some concerns with regard to formatting. And so my team has done some work with researching um, appropriate formats and uh, for, for policies. And while there's not one particular um, format that we that we um, have to take, there is a we've agreed upon a, a particular format. And so what we'll be doing, what we'll be doing from this point forward, is ensuring that all of the policies share this uh, the same format. We went to the legislative. Um, 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 policies manual and we saw a variety of information that would be um, beneficial for us as you know we have contracted with a um, a consultant who has you know I don't know 30 plus years of experience writing policies while that consultant does not write our policies that consultant worked with us in uh, reorganizing the structure because as you know when I got started here uh, there was a, a variety of structures going on within our policies policies and so he worked to help us get that together and, and organize a um a consistent format in terms of what information we put on policy pages. So we've done that, but we're, as we've moved on, some of the formatting and the way that it appears on a page, and whether you start with a, a capital one or a, it does it just is is different. So we've got some work to do in cleaning that up. But uh, I just like to open up this discussion because I know that um, you had some concerns, and we certainly want to hear of those, and, and we'll share with you what we're doing to to rectify anything that needs to be changed. Given that we were going to work down at the table, everyone's laptop is down there, all my information is down there. If we're not going to work down there, may I go get my information? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, that's going while, to require while you, me to reset up my laptop. That's why we did all okay. that. While you, while you get that, um, I'd like to hear from, if you don't mind, uh, have Mr. Uh, Farley talk a bit about what the process has been with regard to how our policy work gets underway. Mr. Farley. Thank you very much, Dr. Kane. Uh, members of the board, good morning. Um, 
I, I may have said this before, but we had about 257 policies in a three ring binder on a CD and a few on the web page. We began by um, working with um, Mr. Margulies in his experience in developing a policy on policy development. Uh, and while that sounds like a strange title, it's really important because it helps bring us uniformity, which is, I think, some, uh, some of your concern now, that policies were sort of all over the map. Most of these policies were approved in 1993 and, and really haven't changed much since. So we created a master policy list. We created a numbering um, format, a numbering scheme for reg administrative regulations and policies. Um, and we began going through all the policies on a priority basis. So we had agreed in our policy on policy development regulation that policies would be re and regulations would be redlined. The regulations are within the domain of the superintendent in implementing your policies. And, um, and so that's the process we've followed. Uh, the policy on policy development, as Dr. Cain said, specifies the major headings and the, and the content for the most part. Uh, for what has to go into a policy and um, templates were deployed to the HR website uh, for for an action item, an agenda I or an information item, a policy and for an administrative regulation. We then did a, we did a sort of a teach out on that with the CNI team and with others on policy development. We, each of the major stakeholders in policy, such as Mr. Paluski, Mr. Pinder, Mr. Pfister, um, have their realm within these numbers of policies. And so, uh, actually, Mr. Paluski has a couple of them, student services and, and curriculum and instruction. And he has been uh, fantastic about prioritizing them, keeping his people on them, um, and um, so we've been moving forward. Apparently, uh, it, we'll now move backward and, and try to reformat them for a consistency in, um, in the numbering scheme within the page, the paragraph numbering, uh, to get some better consistency. And we'll also implement that in the templates. But um, we've also done a workflow, um, a flow chart if you will, uh, that shows all of the steps and have now amended that to include uh, council review uh, between the first and second reads. So I want to thank you for your attention and concern to this process. It's important for everybody um, and, and we'll keep it moving. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your comments. Um, I'll start just to touch on some of that. Yes, when you open up one of our policies that's out for read, it is redlined. However, when you print it, because many people like to have paper document, they can print the old policy, print the new policy as redlined to see the differences and to make their notes in anything they might want to comment on. When you print it, it's a long process to get over to changing your print um, notification to come out in red line. So I noticed some other counties solved that by underlining their red lined items. So if someone just hits the print button and it's set up to print on gray scale, which it is set up to print on gray scale, it doesn't stand out as red lined because the individual has to actually go through several steps on their own computer to get their printer to print red. So I've noticed that other counties, Anne Arundel in particular, underlines all their changes. So in their screen rendition, it's redlined, it's clear on the screen it's red, and it's underlined. When the individual prints that out, it's gray scale, but it's underlined. So you can take the two policies and see the distinct changes because of the underlining. I would recommend that as a change to ours unless we go in and set ours up to always print in ink red as it shows on the screen. That's not a requirement. Um, it may not even be possible. 
I went through the steps on my printer to make that change, but I found it very helpful when another county actually underlined their changes so when the grayscale print comes out, you see what those changes are. If you don't underline them and they don't come out in red, it's virtually impossible to see those changes unless you look at the screen and go on your paper and highlight them. So that's real difficult, I think, for community in trying to compare the differences and see the changes. Um, so that's the one thing that I noticed that could be an improvement. Um, we've is, that, just is that hard to do? Or is that well, I, frankly, I've never had to set up. I, I printed it on a color printer, so I saw red as red. Right, right. But some counties, and Mr. Mr. Fister and I talked briefly this morning, some uh, organizations use capitalization for a new language, but I think there are a number of ways to meet the need that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so. um, if you want to print it in red from your individual computer, you can go into your computer, your printer requirements, and make that change, and it will print in red. But the general public probably generally prints it right from the screen, and that comes out in grayscale. And nothing stands out as our changes because they haven't been bolded or underlined. I know by doing that we then have to go and remove that as the process moves to approval of that policy and we post that as a final policy. That would be something that would have to come out. But I think it makes it much easier for the stakeholders to to work with a policy they might have some comments on. Um, we've noticed the formatting differences. Um, you know, it's very important to always have page numbers on every policy and every regulation. We don't always do that. Um, we tend to cut and paste from our old policies into our new policies. So if an old policy followed one outline design, let's say Roman numerals, and our new policy follows an alphabetical outline design, equally acceptable, both are acceptable. As you cut and paste, you're bringing Roman numeral numbering and the A's and the B's and the I's and the double I's over into a different format. So everything has to be redone. Um, one policy in particular that had been cut and pasted, we started with A for purpose, B for next, C, and then they started pulling over the documentation from the old policy, which was Roman numerals. So the next section was section one, Roman numeral one. It came over as that, and everything subsequent after that was under that outline process. Someone misunderstood Roman numeral one as alphabetical letter I, and now all of a sudden, as the policy was pasted and the changes were made, it went to I, J, K, L, M under an ABC process. So it looked like we skipped a whole bunch of letters, which really it was the Roman numeral I for number one section, the first section. And we also even often, um, we note a section, like as in section three, up in the body of some of our original information. So if we had an old policy that was under the Roman numeral system and we um, highlighted section three for some reason, we now need to rename section three to whatever format we're following. If we're going to an alphabetical format, wherever that section falls, let's say it falls in section K, Section 3, uh, Roman numeral, needs to be changed to Section K under the new process. Our policy um, on ethics is a prime example. That's the policy I'm saying that, as it was cut and pasted, carried over old formatting, actually uh, referenced old sections, none of which got cleaned up in the transfer process. So we just have to be real diligent. Um, now, I do have a question on also. On, that, on mm -hmm. that same subject before we move on. Was that part of the contract of, was it format, was that the whole picture was what that contractor was going to do, or no. they only worked on? No. So we have a, somebody in the staff has to do that for? Exactly. Yeah, so the, the contractor is uh, over, uh, uh, yeah, uh, well okay. well over that, and, and ensuring that we have appropriate policies, one, and that we have a numbering system, because what you'll see is that from, there's a lot of policies here from 1993 that, are, we really, I mean, they wouldn't be 
what we would write as a policy today. There are some policies from 2011. You'll see that's another group. Um, so there are a variety, some of them you'll see are actually scanned that were typewritten. So we have so much work to do um, on our policies that we can, we, we are systematic about it. So one of the things that the contractor did was he said, okay, here's an opportunity for you. We put them on a rotation. So these are policies, and I started with priorities because there were policies um, written that said the superintendent in 2017 is going to um, add a regulation or a procedure for this policy. So we started with the ones that were priorities. And then, of course, ethics is, um, there were some revisions for that, so that was a, a priority. So he helped us to organize how we're going to put our policies on a rotation to make sure that we've revised them um, and that they have a numbering system. Um, he helped us with some language as we revise certain policies. He helped us to organize how we're going to do our regulations, those sort of things. But he does not actually write the policy, nor does he do anything um, with regard to typing them or, or anything like that. Okay. And, 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 that, and that's, that's definitely a need because when you, when you go back, and we recognize it, I mean, that is without a shadow of a doubt one reason why, you know, I contracted with him so that he could help us to see what some of the priorities ought to be because things were so all over the place. Um, and he has done quite well in helping us to do that. We, we need more time with him and we're going to propose that um, because there's a lot of work that has to be done with regard to the policies. A lot of work has been done, has been completed, uh, as you well know, over the course of the year, we've revised multiple um, policies. And then as legislation occurs, we've got to write policies sometimes as legislation happens, you know, as of last year. So we had several that are coming forward now based on legislation that was just recently proposed. So those are the kinds of things. But there is not consistency in any of the policies, um, I'm going to, not going to say in any, in many of the policies prior to uh, 2014. Um, not consistency. So our work is going to be broad and it's going to go over a period of time. So we recognize that. Um, and I think Mr. Burns, our uh, board counsel, made a, uh, a poignant statement last time we met in saying that content-wise or from a legal point of view, we're not having an issue. Our issue is certainly in formatting. Um, so as you have been proposed, as bills have, I mean, uh, legislation has been proposed, policies, there have been none that presented an issue with regard to legality or the content that's written in the policy. What we've got to work on further is cleaning up the format so that it's a consistent uh, format for all of the policies. And what we're going to do is moving forward, um, we're, we're going to start with a, a particular format where we'll start with a Roman numeral one, and then we'll go to A, a capital A, and then we'll go to a number one, and then it'll go to a small A, and then it'll go to a double Roman numeral, small Roman numeral. So there's a format that we're going to take. We're going to move forward with that format, more format for all of the policies that we move forward from this point on, and then we're going to go back and we're going to revise policies, certainly as of last year will be um, a priority because those are the ones that have been revised uh, under my leadership. Um, and, and as we move forward and as long as we can catch up on that, any policy moving forward will be in the proper format. But that's interesting because that's the format we used to use. No. Yeah, it's right if here, 2012, one, applicable and definition. So we can name this anything else. So some of Roman them are. One, are Roman yeah. numeral yeah. two, yeah. Roman numeral two, Roman so, numeral. So we've taken a good scan. Of, <laughs> some of them are, many of them aren't. Right. So at some point, we kind of had a decent process. And then it sort of fell apart. So if we can clearly put on our plate that we're going to get all of our formatting issues under control a as time presents, because it's going to be a big job, um, making sure that our policies are numbered by page and making sure that they all follow the same outline guidelines and that those in print out to read are correctly numbered and actually read and make sense as we read them and as they change from one outline form to the next item in the outline. That's the battle. I That's think, the battle. I, I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah. So moving forward, 
we're going to use the format that I just mentioned. Um, and as we can, we'll go backward as of last year, 17, 18, clean up formatting for those policies. I'm honestly, I'm going to tell you the truth, it is quite the undertaking. We are it absolutely is. not staffed to have somebody going back years and years and years, and those policies are going to have to be revised anyway, so it really does not make good sense, because some of them in 2011 through 14 and, and well before that, they, you can take a look, anybody can take a scan and see that they are not all in the format that I just mentioned. Uh, they are all over the place, so, but it, does not, it doesn't behoove us to spend our energy going back to put old policies in a new format. It should be moving forward, and that's what we're going to do. I, I agree. With what I wanted to mention was 257 policies. It is clearly a huge undertaking to straighten them out after you um, – but, but I think the key is what you said, for the public's in, in interest and knowledge, the, they are, everything is still legal. So we're Absolutely. not following things that are breaking any laws. If anything, the laws might be, um, might be some new ones in that Correct. we have to create, and you're making that a priority. But it's important that we are still following correct legal policies, which really matters to the public. The other thing is um, we do not, we've constantly been, taking away positions at central office, which are people that can do this kind of, of admin work. Um, right now, you know, you have your, your supervisors and your, your C&I folks, the, the head leaders, making good salaries, trying to mess with formatting and that there's something wrong with that. Yeah. So yeah. we need to rethink that. Maybe we need to get a temporary person in here just to do admin to square away a big bulk of policies when we're ready for it or something like that. I'm open for looking at something like that. that um, we have because actually several it's, it's, possibilities for that. I mean, we could reach out to the, an intern. We could talk sure. to Chesapeake College. Uh, we could talk to our AP English groups who definitely are idea. learning to do that. That's a great but idea. you know what? I'm fine with them being legal. This is an education organization, and we should be putting out as few mistake-ridden documents as we can, and we need to be the um, lead for our community in seeing well-published documents. And so my, my issue, um, formatting is, is one, no doubt, huge undertaking, and I am glad to hear that um, we're in line with things that we need to be in line with legally with Mr. Burns. Um, my concern was, um, y you had mentioned, um, Mr. Farley, that each of the major stakeholders within a policy are sort of called in as the policy is being revised. And my question would be, uh, those stakeholders, you know, if we have a special content area, are we looking to uh, stakeholders within that special content area who may be a part of our community and not necessarily just here within our staff? We have stakeholder groups that we communicate drafts for for feedback, but that doesn't change from time to time based on the nature or content of the proposed policy. But shouldn't it? If we have a policy for our disabled students, shouldn't our um, special education organizations be a part of that stakeholder group that would look at that disability policy as opposed to, um, let's say, the NAACP, because I did see them as listed as a stakeholder group that would review, review policies? Wouldn't we want our stakeholder groups that are reviewing our policies to have something to do with that particular policy? I think it makes good sense. Your point's well taken. Do we well. have any kind of checklist for that? Do we have a checklist that it went out to stakeholders and these are the ones that this particular policy went to, these are the comments they came back with or they came back comment free, that's been checked off our policy workflow, our organizational chart, and then we go on to the next step. I think it um, would really kind of be interesting when you pull up a policy that's out for read, there's a, a document on top of that policy where it's kind of an internal document, probably for admin control, where it kind of lists some things that we've done. That would be a prime place to put that this went out to stakeholders, and these are the stakeholders this particular policy went out to. These are the comments they came back with, or they came back comment free. And then we move on, and we know our special education groups 
looked at our disability policy. Um, if we have an ethnic policy or an equity policy or something for minorities, then we would reach out to minority groups. I know the LMB was mentioned on the list as always going out to, um, I believe the NAACP was at, as appropriate, but I think we have other stakeholders that maybe we're missing. I'll confer so, with the superintendent. Yeah, so we'll uh, I'm happy to make a comment on that. And any suggestions? Absolutely. So the document that you're talking about, the cover sheet, mm -hmm. that is an internal document, and that's one also that our consultant helped us with. Mm -hmm. um, and the flow chart that you have here, mm -hmm. that is um, another document that he helped right. us with so that there's a mm -hmm. consistency in how mm -hmm. we develop policy. Um, but we certainly can add uh, a, a place on that um, cover seat sheet so that you can see the stakeholder groups that have reviewed mm -hmm. um, and, and if we got any comments um, Because isn't back. that on our, our flow chart? In and the policy. Went, oh, it's in the policy, mm -hmm. not on our flow chart. Mm -hmm. But we can add it to our flow chart, we can add it to a our admin absolutely. document. Okay. And, and one thing also I wanted to make a comment with regard to is it depends on what the policy is. Right. So sometimes if the policy is based on legislation or COMAR, we use that exact language so that we are not in any jeopardy of uh, misinterpreting what that law was sub was meant to um, to share with us. So those kinds of things, we pretty much get that handed down to us, and, and we want to strictly align with that. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what the policy is with regard to how much uh, we alter that policy. But all of the policy should be going out for public viewing, regardless of where it came from, and anybody, yes, can make a comment. But we're happy to make any of those changes that you just mentioned. I think Mr. Farley uh, captured that. Um, and I also have a question, and I'm not an expert on policy by any means. Please don't anybody um, misunderstand that. Is there a reason we have a regulation and a policy? Yes. Um, because I tend to think not every organization does that either. They do men, meld them into one. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll look and see most school districts do. And the reason is because you may have the policy that says what needs to happen, but then you probably need some kind of guidance to say how it is to happen um, and the procedure in which it, ha how we administer, how we apply that policy. Okay. So that's what the regulation is okay. for. And that's so. the difference really between what the school board us, the five of us do, and the superintendent does. Right. We and don't, I think that uh, needs to be approved. Uh, that needs regulation. to exist. Yes, we right. don't approve regulation. Right. However, is regulation, you have a regulation and you have a policy. I do see that most organizations refer to that regulation on the policy itself. Um, I misunderstood that, that they combine the two into one document. It must be more of a reference point. They start their policies with regulation and the name of that particular regulation, perhaps for the public to be able to go to that regulation directly. I don't know why. Um, here's a, let me find a copy of one that does that. They, they clearly put regulation at the top of their policy and then they go into their policy. And um, maybe that's something that we need to do as we are having two documents lead the public over to where they should find their regulation. Um, this one. May I uh, paraphrase what I understand uh -huh. to make sure it's what you want? Um, would it meet your needs to include a reference to the regulation in the policy so that they're uh, linked? Um, I'm asking, is that appropriate? Um, because I'm pretty sure one of our counties does theirs that way. And I'm guessing they do it. So if someone has a question about the regulation, they know what it's called. It's referenced in the policy. It's real easy to kind of find our policies. You know, you might not look them um, up under the exact title, but they're clear enough title-wise for us to figure out which one is which. We go in there, suppose we have a question about the regulation. If we don't know what the regulation is called or where to find that, we can't find it. Right. I, I didn't find, um, well, basically our regulations, when they're out for read, are with our policy. Correct. However, when you go to our chart, our policy chart, and pull up our policy, the regulation isn't there with it. No, it's because, not. And, and most of the time, 
the policies that were written previously didn't, didn't have. have regulations. Right. Do we, but where do we find the ones that do have regulations right now, currently? Where do we find our regulations? I couldn't find them. Our regulations, if you, lo if you go to the About Us tab mm -hmm. and down to Policies and mm -hmm. Administrative Regulations, the page that first appears in the left-hand column, you'll see the word Regulations and just click on it. Okay. Okay. And are they um, titled exactly as the policy they pertain to? Generally, I'd say. Yeah, but, I, know, I don't know. Any that we have done. Done, yes. Are the same. Okay. okay. Um, if there was a procedure or something prior to, it may gotcha. not be, but what we do, as you notice, are, are the same. Gotcha. And, and it's just a gotcha. slight difference in the numbering. But we've had a conversation, we've had conversations, more than one, about how they, this is displayed, where it is clear on our website, it says policies, and that is also another link for regulations. A better format would be to have the policy and the regulation together on the chart, uh -huh. right? The whole, uh -huh. that listing of policies so that it's right there together. So that's, that. I mean, that's a suggestion that Well, it's kind of like our um, agenda. When we have an agenda and we have policies to, to review we have the agenda item as a policy and a number and right under it we have the regulation and the title of and its number if we conformed our chart into that process we would have each with each and that would probably be an improvement is Harlow um, <clears throat> the policy scheme is for instance if you had uh, drinking water policy 108 and then you add two regulations, they would be 108.1 and 108.2. So in that way, they can be seen as mm -hmm. related. Mm -hmm. But I think what Dr. Kane is talking about is what we'd actually like to Happened do, together. which is put them sort of subordinate to the policy in the same web page. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do, do, oh, my question was just, you had mentioned out of this legislative um, session, there being some new policies that we will have to have regulations for implementation. And my question was just, is there any financial resources that have to be allocated for those regulations to take place? Uh, not at this point. So one, um, one in particular that just comes to mind, just because we just uh, wrote a policy and it's out for read right now, is the sunscreen policy. Yeah. So <laughs> that's legislation that occurred. Mm -hmm. There is language along with that. We create a policy mm -hmm. based on that legislation. So that's what that's how that happens. That's the process for that happens. How that happens. There's no dollars that come, you know, with that, and there are no dollars that are needed for that. There are, um, from time to time, um, legislation that require dollars, and sometimes it's unfunded manda mandates, and we have to figure out how we're going to, um, you know, fund those kinds of things. We're not looking at any of that right now, no. <laughs> but Good. with ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, that big one, and we've had a lot of conversations about Kerwin, that's mm -hmm. an example of, you know, some unfunded mandates that, that, may, that we may be looking at. But that's a little bit down the line right Not now. Right now. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. But okay. that's just an example. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Thank so you. since we're still on kind of the chart, our policy um, notification on our website actually says that we'll put in green font any policy that we're um, working on as a draft policy. Um, I highly recommend we start adding a watermark to our drafts that says draft. It's easy to do. Um, then no one mistakes a policy that they've pulled off the website that's out for read as permanent yet. It still indicates as a draft. Do we send them out for read when they're drafts? No, when it goes out for it's, read, it's it, not. It is, it is a draft, but right. It, it's I mean, it's a working draft, but it's not on the policy chart, unless there is a current policy that exists, and the one that we're proposing is a revision of it. In which case, the current policy still stands, okay. and so it would need to be okay. there. All right. So, so, like right now, when we pull up our list of policies, none are in green. Does that mean none of them are in draft those, process? No. Those policies um, that were in green were identified as gaps, areas where we needed policy and didn't have it. And I think that was confusing for people. So we're taking that whole green piece away. Okay. Okay. Well, I do recommend that they carry a watermark of draft until they are approved. 
Um, and when we pull up our policies for comment on our tab on our website, sometimes they'll say policy out for it says policy for first read until a date. Do we not do that for, I know we're going from a three read to a two read process, so I do understand we still have policies that are going through a third read because we haven't gotten them through the system yet, but generally our new policy is to only do two reads. Do we not signify the second read on that list? We signify what's out for first read, but we do not signify what's out for second read because I don't see any no, that are, and they the are out for second on read. The agenda or no, no, on no. On, the on web, our policies on the web for public page. comment on the website, on the web page, under the tab mm -hmm. for um, policy. I mean, for home, under home, when you go to policies for public comment, the list shows the policies that are out for first read. Very first one is our health policy right now, policy number 531. Policy for first read until 11 7 18. Do we not do that for second read? Well, uh, Ms. Harlow, uh, policies that are in draft would be posted f between their first read and second read. And unless the board holds their decision in abeyance for some reason, they would then come down and should come down from that public comment uh, area. After the first read, you mean? After, They're not the, after the second read. Right, and that's read. why I'm asking why we don't signify that they are in that second read process until that expires so people know, oh, this is the policy I looked at a month ago and I made a comment on. Let me go into the second read and see if any of my comment is reflected in the new read. Because the reads are where our improvements are made. Or the reads are where our errors are corrected. The reads are where the public has given their comment. And if it's an appropriate improvement, it should be implemented. But we don't signify what's up here for second read. We, uh, we've been reviewing the public comment portion. We realized recently that it needed some attention in terms of updating uh, what was out there and making sure that it would accommodate the comments. So we do have work to do on there. Your comment about the, the draft watermark um, on drafts, or at least making it clear, uh, I think this can be improved. Okay, well, again, we sit up here and we approve policies in our meetings for second read, excuse me, for second read. Why wouldn't we note it on our public page where the comments are being made and where people are following the improvements from the start to the finish of a policy? Because trust me, there are people who watch our first read, they watch our second read, and they come back and they look at our final policy as it gets posted to our list to see those improvements have been made and those errors have been corrected. Why wouldn't we note that we're in our second policy read sec section, segment, whatever? I'm not sure process. I completely so, understand. So uh, I guess this is, this is a question, and we have put policies out there for second read. Um, the part of the issue is that Ms. Harlow is raising is basically, do we put policies on this page for review that are in second read? Mm -hmm. No. We, we have first read policies and then we take them down after second read. You said done. after second after. read. So but my point is that policies read? are still out for second read. Yes. Are still on this list. She just wants it on this sheet. Policies that it says for public comment to have the second read ones listed also. That's all she wants. Right. And when a policy has gone through second read and approved, it would come down and should come down. This is yes, as they're going but through until reading. then, why couldn't it say policy for second read until probably the board meeting date where we're going to approve it as a final policy would be the date that you would put in there as your temporary date, I would guess. So I'm looking at school health policy number 531 and regulation 531.1. Those are new well, and they're only at first read. Right, so it says policy for first read until 11 7 18. Okay. And, and that's what you want, is that correct? You, that's correct. That's going on. Let's let's look at policies for second read that were on our agenda for the tenth. On the tenth, we had on our written agenda that we read from policies that were presented for first read on August eighth, and now we were being 
uh, we presented them for second read on October 10th. The very first one was education of students with disabilities. On our website right now, education of students with disabilities is listed as available for public comment until September 8th. As of October 10th, it appeared on our written agenda that we read from as a policy for second read. Why couldn't it reflect that on this public page? And I also have to bring attention to the fact that, unfortunately, none of these policies that were put up for us to approve for second read or the rescission chart actually appeared on the public agenda. They only appeared on the agenda the President and I read from. We were asked to approve policies for second read, and there was no section on our agenda containing those. So let me compartmentalize that because you said a couple of different things mm -hmm. there. So the, the first thing, first things first. So while we leave the policy on the website, I believe that what Ms. Harlow is asking is that we identify that this policy is now in second read rather than just leave it up there for public comment. So identify that it's in second read. And change the date for the appropriate end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because and, and the other part, I'm not sure. Um, well, okay, so let me expand on that. Just to say, I printed this today. No, uh, yes, I printed this this morning. And it still shows education of students with disabilities is available for public comment until September 8th. However, that was a policy that we were asked to approve for second read on October 10th. So that's that's the same thing I'm saying. So it's but you were t and I think we're clear on that part. We're clear but you on made that part. a second okay. point. My second point was these policies that we were asked to approve for second read never appeared on our agenda. It didn't appear on our public agenda and it didn't appear on the board agenda that we get to see in the private docs. It did appear on the written agenda that the secretary prepared for the president and the parliamentarian to read from but it is not on our agenda for the public or the board. The, the second reads were on the agenda. Maybe you're talking about, maybe you misspoke nope. and meant Dr. rescission. Dr. Uh -huh. the conversation you and I had yesterday mm -hmm. about the numbering and mm -hmm. it's missing on the public agenda it is. and what Mrs. The Wright numbering. may have done, that the conversation we had yesterday might, where we, we think because the board rescinded. Oh, oh. That, oh, okay. That's why it came off of the agenda. No, what? It, it wasn't on there the day of the meeting. It was, I read I it. I went home I read it. and looked on the day of the meeting that night. It wasn't on there. You mean it came down that fast? I know, I read it, it got removed it, from, it, from us leaving at 1030 until I pulled it at 11? I think Dr. King can address it, that. It very well could have. Because, because she was going away. Right, okay. because Ms. Wright was okay. leaving. But it was on the agenda because it was read. Okay. And we, and we well, discussed I it. I read it. Yeah. Annette read it, but she read it from this paper copy. This isn't the same as the agenda. But that it was on, on board docs, board docs okay. because we were in okay. board docs. I'm because I went in home at a, I went home at eleven yeah. and I pulled up that agenda. Yeah, and, and it wasn't there. And she stayed a little. Miss Wright stayed okay. a little bit. I walked out okay. with her, so she probably was pulling it at that point. Perfect sense. Mm -hmm. That would make perfect sense. I read sense. it the day before. It was on. trying to get ready for the meeting. Now, um, so that kind of leads us into another issue that I have. Can I ask? A uh huh. Go uh, ahead. Just um, in terms of the timeline, I know we moved during my time on the board from doing two, from doing three reads to two reads before final approval. Um, what what do you think that's done to our timeline? I know we're trying to get through 257 policies um, from oh, first read you. to second read um, versus when we were doing three reads. Um, bless you. Uh, what does that timeline look like? In, in your recollection, was it six months when we were doing three reads and now we're down to three months? Is, have you had any gauge of how that's worked for us? Uh, you know, I think, um, I think we need to um, focus on what the board's expectations are for timeliness, how quickly we will be prepared for and act upon policies. Um, I think the flow chart lays it out pretty well. Dr. Kane has insisted that certain steps take place in the latter portion of the business process. Like you have three days to do this, you have four days to do that. So uh, I, I think uh, it's getting much better, but as an institution, we too are all getting better at working on policies and saying what we mean and meaning what we say. So mm -hmm. um, I think we're doing better. It's not perfect yet. 
Um, but I, s I still Ms. Osborne, yeah, uh, for, to answer your question, it, um, uh, Osborne. it, um, O'Connor, I know it, Carrie Osborne, I'm always saying her, um, it, it, um, it took about three and a half, almost four months to get something out, and I think one of the problems we had is when it went to third read, we, we'd never get any comments. So I think people were done with it after two reads, just for and your information. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's one of the key reasons for making it just two reads, that just my sense. thought on it. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's been a good thing. I didn't have a historical context to yeah, put it, it in. it just took a long a time. Board member. Right. Yeah. The, the other issue with it is that when we had board meetings that were not exactly 30 days apart, then it automatically pushed that policy out to another month. So... And because we don't approve uh, policies at work sessions, it was a clear additional month that we'd have to wait. Um, so we went from three reads to two reads and then between board meetings mm -hmm. so that it's a time when you can look at it and vote on it. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I have a concern, too, on the flow chart. Putting legal analysis after it's already been out for first read. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we look at the legal thing before it even goes out? That's because a good point. Because people are commenting on something that may not even the be legal. The council can certainly um, weigh in on that. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, he's, he's going to. Oh, I'm sorry. Darren, come on. <laughs> Your pleasure. Uh, <laughs> For the record, Darren Burns, uh, Board Council, um, on the issue on the on the topic of when when to bring in, in you know Board Council or any outside council to advise the board or the school system on policy, I think to some extent you take the recommendation of the superintendent, and I believe you have uh, Mr. Margulies. I've, I've known him for years. Mr. Margulies, very experienced in school system matters. This is part of his bailiwick. I think. He is an attorney. I think as part of his process, if getting to that first read, the staff with input of the stakeholders, with the superintendent's leadership, with her folks having gotten that policy and or regulation to a certain stage, and with her having an advisor to help get it at least in that first read stage, I'm not sure the board requires you know, the resources of outside counsel to that place. Having gotten to that place though, then it makes sense, I think Mr. Farley and I have had this conversation before on a couple of recent policies, it makes sense at that place where so many folks have weighed in on what the product looks like to then ask counsel, because then you're not talking about what people prefer, what people want, what people believe on policy, it's how does this look that we've gotten this far. I think it's a good place to bring me in or someone else in. And then it's up to then the superintendent and staff will not need to bring it back to the board until they're satisfied, between my comments and other public comments, that that second read is ready. I mean, you can control that flow. Um, and to get to the point I think Ms. Connor raised, or question she had is, that the two read process really makes a lot of sense. And it's got an analog in what a lot of boards do, including this board at times, in that information action approach to things, where the first time it's out there for folks to comment on is information, and the second time is action. And that's a very typical school board process. And so I think two reads is enough. And if, to get to your point, um, if, if, if board council has an opportunity to read that first process, that first procedural step, I, I think that's adequate. And that's not to say that superintendent or staff wouldn't call on me at the, at the beginning of it. A great example is when a law is passed, and sometimes when a state board opinion or state bylaw is passed, that requires Dr. Dr. Kane to immediately get something implemented, you know, from, from between August and October, let's say. Right. She may quickly call and say, look, can you take a look at this, and are we on the right track? And, and, I'll, and I'll always be I mean, available for that. Sure. But I think as a process goes, I like in between first and second read. I think it's conservative on your resources. Okay. Um, and, I, and I would just, I want you all to know, too, that um, you've touched on a couple of really important points. Uh, this is, comes from 25 years of doing these things. I think one of the best things you can do as a, as a board in a modern age with a website is have a single place on website, I'll call it the port of entry, point of entry, in which there's no other place on the website, let's say, but the front page under board or under school system where folks find policies and regs. And within that, again, you've talked about this, there should be a unified list of policies and regulations. Whatever your numbering system is, or numerical or alphanumerical, it should be one place, and there should be another tab for review of ones that are under that are proposed, and folks should not search different places, but more to the point of the legal issue, 
you want to avoid there being back doors to wrong information. And so when you have a website that has one place right out there for the public, it helps you as staff, it helps you as a board, and it helps the public know, I don't have to worry that there's something else out there we're not aware of, and you know that the public is well served. So I strongly recommend a unified policy reg list, a single place on the website to find it all and make comments. Um, I, I think with respect to the numbering and naming, it's a little bit like the Dewey Decimal Library of Congress thing. It's not so much what you choose, it's that you're consistent. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I, this whole program, there's been a move to JH-RA and all these letters. I'm not so sure the public's any better served by that than a straight out numerical with decimal points. Right. I, I don't think that's what matters. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have a policy, just remember, it does not require regulation. If you have a regulation, it's life is breathed into a by board policy. So you're always going to find the one on a topic. You may not find the second, but you should not have a regulation that doesn't have an antecedent in a policy. So to me, the reference is not so important that the policy refers to a reg. It's that if you have a regulation that the superintendent has promulgated, it needs to refer to the policy from which it takes its authority. And then, of course, I think you all know this, at the bottom of any policy or reg, to the extent that laws, you know, obligate you to pass them or obligate the superintendent to create procedures, it's great to see those as a reference, right, at the bottom of page one or wherever it is. And again, that's standardized. And, and the last point, I don't want to overstay my welcome, this is one piece that could easily be handled, I think, um, by a staff person, to get back to, I think, Captain Kelly's point, and on a rolling basis make an improvement. I noticed over the last year and a half that in addition to, you know, some formatting issues or whatever, there's also this third type that I was so surprised to find, which is scanned photocopies. And I mean photocopies. I don't think they may be mimeograph copies from the early 90s, slightly crooked, slightly blemished, that literally are sitting in your policy list as a policy. Mm -hmm. You may not want to change any of those. could be great policies. But from a look and appearance standpoint and from not misleading the public about their importance and meaning, I would take any of those, even if they're not subject to, to change, and quickly put them in that word format with the proper numbering, you know, following whatever they have. That's not a substantive change. No. But, boy, it takes you a long way down that, over that hump of what is really, honestly, for a lot of school systems, and, and I think Dr. Kane's probably been careful not to scare everybody this, but it's true. Most systems take three years to really overhaul an outdated policy regulatory scheme. There, it, it does take that long. I've heard people say it's like changing the tire on an 18-wheeler while it's moving. It, it's difficult. And so you've got to bear with, I think, the staff. You bear with your process. And, and, I, and I like the idea of leaning on other people's examples. Well, and we you had know? to start somewhere. Right. We had to start somewhere. And I've also noticed this, the same policies, um, not always, but sometimes, and even later renditions, have nothing in them. They've got a heading, they've got a layout, they've got maybe a page number, and no meat, no substance. But they're sitting there as a current policy. Oh, if I we have to appropriate funds to hire someone to come in here and actually clean things like that up, I would not be opposed to supporting that. And I liked your idea of using our existing resources and drawing upon what we already have uh, in terms of help out. I think if us. we reached yeah. out to Chesapeake College, we would find an amazing resource there. Mm -hmm. um, to save I money. actually think our AP English groups and maybe even some of our just regular um, at, um, senior English classes, our journalism classes, all of these things are our public perception as well as legal process. Right. And we are an education system. Everything that we put out in front of the public should be flawless. Now, no one is perfect, no system is perfect, no human being is perfect. But we should be as close to it as we possibly can be. We are the eyes of, this, of the community in how we're educating our children. If we can't present a nearly flawless piece of paper, and I know we've even had mailers go out from this board, not our current board, not our current superintendent, not our interim superintendent, but over the course of being involved in the system for 33 years, that were an embarrassment. When a stakeholder or a parent gets something in the mail from this office, it really ought to, from 
a written standpoint be darn near perfect. It should be perfect because not only are we proofreading it or should be, our publisher should as well. And so, that hasn't yeah. always happened. And I appreciate that comment. Um, so, and thank you, Mr. Burns, also for your comment because we do have us, you know, with our cleaning up that website, um, we do have one place now that policies and regulations can be accessed. So we don't have that situation where we had three different ways that you could get to information and sometimes it's updated and sometimes it's not. So that piece has been cleaned up. Um, and we do have one place, one central place, for policies to be uh, reviewed and for public to make comment. So that is, um, that's absolutely something that we have, have made an improvement with. A huge improvement. A huge improvement, <laughs> yeah. Um, and those policies, those are the ones that Mr. Burns mentioned that I just talked about, the ones from 1993. There's, there's generally a batch from about 1993. There's another batch from 2011. There's a batch from 2014. So, you know, they sort of go in, in cycles. They all have and, their own little problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 there and there's not consistency, and why would there be from a policy from 1993 to 2014 or 2017, 18? So that's part of the work. That's part of what needs to be done. And 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 I have to, I would be remiss if I did not bring to um for the, you know to everybody's attention the reality and the practicality. So when budget time comes around, and we say we need you know support to do the work that needs to be done. This is what we're talking about. No, it's not putting a teacher in a class, but it is work that has to be done. Um, that's the reality of working in a small schools district. We have people that are doing jobs that are four, five, six, seven jobs, and that could easily be three or four, you know, jobs full time. So when we have that kind of workload on our employees, Absolutely, something's going to get missed. That is the reality. When we far, if we decided that we were going to farm out policy work to students, and I don't care if you're at the college, the community college, or a high school classroom, that still requires somebody to come back and review to ensure that what all of these other entities have done is accurate. So that's yet another step. So we got to be real careful and mindful when we talk about pushing this kind of work out to different groups because it still has to come back to someone for review. Um, you know, so those are just things I want to put that out there. But the, the substantive part of this conversation is that, one, our policies are, are legally absolutely up to, up to par. Um, we've got some issues that we need to deal with in formatting. And I hate to beat a horse to death because we get it. The point is we've got, we have a process that we use now to develop policies. We understand the format that we want to use. We have a variety of resources that we're going to draw from to make sure that that happens. And I don't know that anything else needs to be said about that because we're going to be working on the policies and the format in particular. I want to ensure that we understand these things have to be proofread by somebody as well. It's not I think just that's part, formatting, that's, it's proofreading. I get that. That's part of it. We actually have a policy that we were going to rescind, but because we pulled that vote back, our recension chart is still as it was on the 10th, that refers to another policy as why this policy is going to be rescinded. But when you go to that other policy, there's nothing in it about that particular issue. So in our checks and balances, if you're going to rescind a policy because you've replaced it with a better policy, somebody better darn well make sure that rescinded policy is actually reflected in the new one. I have some questions about the way we rescind. I don't like seeing that we get sent to Comar and no explanation of what, because we're going to get rid of this particular policy and now it's covered in Comar. Comar is a huge document, and our stakeholders are not going to go through that document, and even if they do, can they find where that particular policy is documented in Comar? I, I suggest we be very careful about removing a policy because it's in Comar. And um, I also wonder about removing a policy because now it's covered under our web page. So we have an inclement weather policy. Yes, it's clearly covered under our web page, but does that give us carte blanche to do away with that inclement weather policy? I'm not sure that's a good idea. That's a policy we're asking our staff to adhere to and we want our community to be aware of. If we only reference it in this particular document, 
as being covered under the web page when this particular document goes away, people are still going to go to our policy list and look for our inclement weather policy. It's not going to be there because we've done, done away with it. I'm not sure that's good practice. I do recognize that many of these policies we've talked about in 1993, policies that have no, no information in them whatsoever, a policy that isn't adequate, getting rid of it if it's, if it's no longer pertinent to our system, if it's outdated and we don't even have that particular need anymore, I get that part. But I don't get replacing a lot of policies by referring them to Comar only or because they're covered on a website, I do get get rid of it because now it's covered in another policy, but I don't like going to that policy and finding out it's not covered. So I'm a little concerned about throwing policies out willy-nilly. And I guess we as a board need to be very diligent when we get this list and go in and read every single one of these reasons why these are being rescinded. I won't approve any more rescissions just because it's in Comar. I'll go on record for that right now. I won't Ms. Farley, necessarily do you want to speak to the approve um, because it's covered under the web page. We still need that policy, in my opinion. So while they're being referred to as policies, uh, Ms. Harlow, many of them are really more like regulations in that they're not they're not real real policies. And we said from the beginning of this policy reform project, and let me come back and address that more squarely. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we, they would be treated like procedures, which we now call administrative regulations. Um, but we, we do want to provide appropriate background on, on why. And I agree with you that the Comar is too broad, and I should have caught that and fixed it before it came to the board. With that said, the revisions or rescissions still need to take place. So I'll update, I I'll update that and give a more appropriate reference. And um, in the case of the inclement weather, um, we do have um, a what is probably tantamount to a policy on the web page, on the main home page, um, but it doesn't have a number. So um, I don't know, Sid, do you want to speak to that at all? Or uh, we're talking about if, or it says inclement weather under staff. Um, it says actually under um, the web page, but I'll, I'll just go a little further to say I still hear from our staff they are not always clear, um, they think they are, on what is tier one, what is tier two. They're not clear on what is code red and what is code blue. They call their coworker and say, do we have to go in today or can we stay home? And I believe our community also would like to know what code red and code one and tier one and tier two are. And in my understanding, those used to be reflected in our policy for inclement weather. We, we do have a policy, um, reporting times of employees during in, inclement weather, mm -hmm. policy 426. I believe, Mr., um, when you talk about tiering, you're talking about the, the busing. Right. Yeah, you, yeah, you're talking about the buses. But I believe Mr. Pender is getting ready to speak to this. Um, would, were you getting ready to speak to this, Mr. Pender? I mean, it actually falls in the HR category. I mean, the part that deals with Meyer is just the, um, the transportation buses. of tier right. one and tier yeah. two. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I will say, just being in the system for a while, it is something that you don't use every single day. Right. So then when the first time that we have a weather delay or something, you have those comments like yes. you were just talking Absolutely. about. So, you know, that could be something that, you know, maybe principals could review at a faculty meeting um, or, you know, we could send something out in an email to all staff just stating, hey, when it's code red or code blue. Um, which are, we do, yes. <laughs> we do so so that I, I don't know. I guess you and know it it's is new, on, and it is on the website. Yeah. But does that exonerate us from having a policy for it? A, a policy for for what? A policy for, well, the one that was on the chart last week was the inclement weather policy. So we have to we, be rescinded. So we have a policy for reporting times. That's what No, no, I see that now. Right. But last week on the 10th, mm -hmm. this chart was different. This this chart has been updated since the 10th. Yeah. You're, you're, when when you're, you go back, I think what Ms. Sure. Harlow is saying, when you go back to last week, there's Queen Anne's County Public School policies and regulations to be rescinded. Right. It starts with staff gifts and solicitation 
And then there is one in the middle of it that says reporting times of employees during Oh, is that what it said? Weather. Okay. During inclement weather. It, so, so that is probably the same one I'm looking at. But regardless, um, shouldn't we have a policy? Uh, one of them that was asked to be rescinded last week, annual leave for certified employees, now covered under collective bargaining. But if we had an annual leave certified employee policy that the public could view, why get rid of it just because it was covered in negotiations? Why remove that from public view as a policy when they can't necessarily go to the contract and read it? So the policy is uh, subject to the collective bargaining agreement, which changes. and. Um, so then you have to go in and change the policy if the bargaining agreement changes. It, it's so and the pub, the collective bargaining agreement is, is publicly accessible it's as publicly well. Publicly on the website. Well, the bargaining. I'm going to be watching this a whole lot more carefully than I think I have That's been. Great. That's great. Um, I, I just really want to be careful about us rescinding policies that we still cover somewhere else. It's not an illegal. We're not, I'm not talking from a legal standpoint. I'm talking about from a standpoint where we keep our community as updated as we can and we are as transparent to them as we can be. And when we start taking policies out that probably we need standing, we don't want that to become a burden to us in the future because we removed it. So maybe the conversation should be what we should have a conversation about them because you don't need to have a policy for everything. Some things no, are procedural and so that should cover it. So and with uh, a uh, ne negotiated agreement that changes as you know from from year to year. So and it's not necessarily that everything mm -hmm. in the negotiated agreement changes but it is subject to right bargaining and changing. So that's why you know, you have that, and, and, and I just want to be clear that we don't put policies up for, to be rescinded willy-nilly. Uh, there is some thought that goes into that, and if it is covered someplace else, and as we revise policy, sometimes it is, or if there is a procedure or a negotiated agreement that dictates how we behave uh, with regard to a policy, then that's why that's there. Okay. So there's thought that's put into which ones you see to be rescinded, but perhaps the conversation ought to be, let's have more conversation with regard to the policies that we put up for to be rescinded. Um, um, and, 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 and honestly, you know, a, a work session is a good time to have those conversations so that by the time we get to our board meeting, then you feel comfortable in voting or not, right. you know, on those policies. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, value to having these kinds of conversations. In particular, I believe our fundraising via the internet, which we were rescinding because it said it was covered under the social media policy. That's the one in particular where when I go to the social media policy, there's nothing in there about fundraising. So that's one in particular that we wanted to get rid of because it's covered well in another one. I get that part. I'm fine with that, as long as it is. There's that's nothing a, in there that doesn't. That's a good idea about the work session. Maybe we should make a point Have of the a conversation work session that right. precedes the next meeting. Mm -hmm to have the policies ready for that discussion. That's a great yeah. idea. It'll save save the time on our work, on our actual meetings. Too. Exactly. I'm sorry, Mr. Burns. I think it's an important point because we can dispense with a couple of things you might not need to bring to a work session. Ms. Harlow has pointed out several different types of potential rescinded policies. Two of them I can give you very clear guidance on. There should never be a board policy on an item that's hours, wages, working conditions, and subject to collective bargaining. To the extent that the staff and, and consultant have identified any of these policies that cover topics that are now either, either now part of a negotiated agreement or have been, according to the law, made required to be negotiated, they shouldn't be in your policy. In fact, it, taking them out will prevent you from having an inadvertent unfair labor practice charge, a PSRB complaint. So I, I understand why those would be subject to rescission. The other piece is, um, good example, certificated uh, employee information. Again, not having that in policy because it's in Comar may be an inarticulate way of saying it, but what the real reason is you don't want to run afoul of state law. So if state law covers exactly what's required for certification, let's say, in a particular subject matter area, no local board should have a policy on it. In fact, you shouldn't have a policy referring to Comar 
it's we the law. We have a lot of them. I, I understand that. <laughs> and they may be different reasons. But my point is... As a if, reference. If, that's right. As a reference, and that's appropriate. That's right. If Dr. Keynes and her staff have identified one that's literally superseded by regulation, then it becomes superfluous, unnecessary, and I would again recommend you delete it. And, I, and I'm, it's very different than the weather issue. Yeah. The other yeah. ones. I'm just but letting you know. But that's a great reason two, to have a conversation. Yep. So we, like I didn't know our annual leave for certified employees that used to be a policy shouldn't have even ever existed. Now my legal counsel has told me that. If the superintendent makes a decision about a certain policy and why it's no longer appropriate, and I don't know that, I never get that information. So by having a work session about them on a regular basis, we get informed. Yeah. Because when our community comes and asks us, that's a very important key point that we can make to them. Oh, we talked about this two weeks ago, and this is why. Right. And, that, so. and that's why work sessions, and, and we've had several work sessions canceled or just not held in this district. Yes, and yeah. work sessions are critical. Point in case, what we're talking about right now, last board meeting, we spent an hour and a half talking about goal one, which in in I'm so grateful that the questions were raised that they were, and we had an opportunity to talk about and explain some things. That's why it's important to have work sessions. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I'm not preaching anybody. I'm just advocating to, that we can spend the time having conversations about the things that are critical to run in this district. Um, you know, and, and then that way, when you vote, you are better informed. And that, that would also, be work sessions, I totally agree on always having them and making them robust of gen agendas, mm -hmm. which is like this. Is That's perfect. the time to talk about it, get clarity. Uh, uh, and it's not a new item. Our, our manual, our, our board of, um, handbook. excuse me, handbook. our handbook. board of ed members of Ambul, member handbook has always said that the second Wednesday of every month would be a work session. Now, once in a while that may need to be changed. I won't always advocate for it to be um, canceled move it a week if if it's a holiday or someone's schedule is in conflict move it a week don't just not have it um, because that's what they're for that's what they're for to do this kind of work that we cannot sit here till midnight doing in regular monthly meetings we have other work to do in reg regular monthly meetings so yes I think we're all on the same page for that um, I'm thinking this is a good time to break for lunch <laughs> okay <laughs> So, so, our, so can we bring a close to the policy? And so the next thing that we bring forward will be the capital improvement plan? Uh, no, I'm not done with policy. Oh, okay, Sorry. you are? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Welcome back to the Queen Anne's County Board of Ed work session. And we will continue forward. Excuse me. All right, so I think we've covered our concerns about policies. Does anybody have anything else in the way they're formatted, they're legalized, um, <coughs> kind of the plan that we're projecting to get on and the guidelines that we'd like to see followed and the flow kind of catching up. As Mr. Paluski and Dr. Kane both um, well defined, it's a, and, and our legal counsel as well, it's a long process. And, um, but I feel it's important that we use our transparency, that our community is aware that we're working on this. Um, we're aware of the problems. We're not making excuses for them. And we are um, on a mission to improve. So now I'm going to go forward to how we've been paying for some of this. Um, I have several letters to the commissioners that we have requested categorical changes on. We also approach the commissioners when we make within category changes, and that's just a notification to them. They don't have to approve it. It's our um, good faith and transparency in informing them we've done that. But we as a board approve those, but we send them to the commissioners as a notification. They don't have to approve them. But anything that we change, and Mr. Fister, step in if I misspeak. Anything we change category to category, we do have to request approval from the commissioners. So 
back in November of 2017, which is about a month after, I believe, Mr. Margo Margolius was hired, um, we transferred um, several dollar amounts um, in different categories with the approval of the commissioners. And um, one of the things that we transferred was to transfer funds allocated for supplies to equipment to purchase additional classroom and replacement laminator and replacement chairs for staff. So that was like our first transfer that I remember for 2017. And then we did another transfer on February and um, that was for um, transportation from special ed and there was also a category to transfer instruction to administration for $55,000 and it was documented that 35,000 of that would be our comprehensive compensation study. It would be website design work and consulting services for policy review. So those two combined carried a amount of 20,000. I'm not sure exactly how much of the 20 went for either or, but then we moved on to um, April and this was also a transfer request to um, transfer within categories and this wasn't something the, that the commissioners had to approve but we had to notify them of and at the time of our meeting on April 11th the verbiage wasn't quite right and it was explained to us that we didn't have a correct copy of this letter and that the dollar amounts weren't correct and that was going to be rewritten and um, member George said well I'm not going to approve a letter that you know doesn't really exist yet so Mr. Gorchus was our interim at the time and he printed us a financial printout that actually showed these dollar amounts being transferred so that was indication to us that it was proof enough that those transfers had happened and we would approve this letter being rewritten and submitted to the commissioners but we never really followed up on that and no one ever supplied us with the rewritten letter we still have this letter attached to our agenda which was not approved I've never seen the letter that actually went to the commissioners and I've asked for that um, and Dr. Kane said she'd have that for me today um, but as this dollar amount was explained, it was $21,600 was what was being transferred and 13 days of it were work days in April for our financial interim and 14 days in May. And that was clearly explained in our meeting on April 11th that um, $21,600 was 13 days of pay for Mr. Gorshitz in April and 14 days in May. So when we got our next letter for transfer, it was for $50,000 and it signified policy improvement again and a small amount of time that was still needed to pay our interim chief financial officer until Mr. Fister could start on June 1st. So if we had paid Mr. Gorsuch already 14 days in May, I kind of did a quick scan of our calendar and saw there were eight additional work days in May to pay him for. And at the rate that he seemed to be paid at based on the April 11th letter, that meant based on that, how much of this 50,000 actually went to pay him for his eight days. And it was $6,400. And of that $50,000 transfer, that leads me to believe that policy improvements was left with $43,600. But we haven't done $43,600 worth of work. And we have a bill for $6,600 worth of work. So I'm kind of asking, how did we transfer some part of 20 in February and 50 in June for policy work, but we only have a $6,600 bill? So, <clears throat> Ms. Harlow, uh, so coming in in June, some of this, of course, pre you know, predated me. But sure. from what I was able to gather and 
the transfer that you're referring to in June being my first one based on some of the projections that we had, we had submitted, because projections are only good at the time that you do those projections. We had, I believe we had anticipated on some of my analysis that we would be spending a little bit more than the $6,600 for Mr. Margulies. We also had other costs. We had a cost overrun with our temporary uh, public information um, specialist and um, I believe we also had some additional website work that was done. All of that is in the administration category. So in fact, yes, we did allocate and request a transfer based on some data that didn't come to fruition, but let you know that we ended the year with about $30,000 of that left unspent of the 50,000 that was transferred in June. See, that's where I get into some real questions because this was dated June 13th and our school year ended, our fiscal financial year ended uh, 17 days later. And so when you see a $50,000 transfer for that, most people are going to assume it's already transpired. You're, you're going to pay yourself back for things that you've already done. N not under my regime, ma'am. <laughs> but, but, but I'm going to be proactive when said, it comes to this. If it's the other way around, it still was only for 17 days till the fiscal year was over. And we ought to be able to calculate a little bit closer Agreed. to 30. I'm, twi I'm sorry, 20 as what we would need for the next 17 days than to Agreed. ask for 50 and have 30 left over. And Agreed. these are the kind of things our community and our governing body has problems with. So that's why I'm asking these questions. This looks like we have paid almost $70,000 in policy work, oh, ma'am. but we only have $6,600 to show for it or to- And, in, and, in and please keep in mind that even though the, the statement, that is a brief description of some of the things that we did, like I mentioned, we had um, a cost overrun due to our public information officer that was there. We did have some additional Can days. I interrupt you on that? Because that was one of the questions that was asked in April. On April 11th, when we had this letter presented to us that we needed to notify the commissioners on, we didn't have to ask for approval. We are allowed to move monies within our categories without commissioner approval, but as a good faith effort in transparency, we provide them with that information. Well, that it's actually a requirement by law up. we do inform them. That question came up because some people on the board had a um, letter that said $10,000, I see that our letter that was attached said contractual services of $25,500. Dr. Kane figured out pretty quickly in our meeting, because trust me, I went back and I watched these meetings, that we didn't have the right document. That's why we didn't approve the actual letter. So Mr. Gorsuch went out and did financial uh, reports for us and brought them to us at the time of the board meeting to justify that those monies had been transferred. And uh, Member George even asked something about Dr. Pearson because at some point that was mentioned, but then it was like, no, that's not what any of this is for because you guys have the wrong letter. We're only gonna ask for 21.6 and that is strictly for Mr. Gorsuch for the 13 days in April and the 14 days in May. So when we start putting things on paper, we need to be a little clearer if we think of a $50,000 transfer being a large amount of money. If we think we're going to use it for X, Y, and Z, Put X, Y, and Z on there. Don't just put A and B. Well, let me, just to be clear, and I know you'll jump behind me, this has nothing to do with uh, Mr. Fister because Mr. Fister was not I, here I in get April. That. I get and, that. And we, it is not um, unknown that I had concern with the way we, um, how transparent we were with the way we did our finances previously. Um, and so we do have Mr. Fister here now who is, uh, we sort of came up through some of the same, um, 
you know, training and whatnot. And so we have a similar mindset with regard to how transparent we need to be. So this is not to put anybody down, but the way that it had gone on in this district for many, many years uh, prior to myself or Mr. Fister is not the way that he nor I have been accustomed to, to doing business. And it won't be the same. Um, but what we did was we went back to go to see, you know, exactly where the dollars were. And even though we had put down here that we wanted to do, and one of them, and I apologize, so That's one okay. one of them had to do with a, uh, a financial audit, which I said to the school board that I wanted to do. So we transferred dollars from instruction to do that. We didn't do it. You know, we never got to a place where we were able to do it. So that did not happen. There are places here where we asked for funds um, because we anticipated that we'd be able to uh, do certain services, and part of that has to do with uh, the policy work. So we asked for $10,000, and that has to do with uh, the first one that you talked February about. February 7th, no so it was 10 and 10? It was 35, 10, and 10, okay. which, as you can see, we provided you with the um, the documents with what we actually paid. We didn't spend all of that. So, and part of that had to do was I thought we had $5,000 when we actually had $10,000. And so when we had the 10000 we did go on and continue to use services, but not anything close to near what, what you're thinking. Um, so with regard to the, and I think what you did was calculate what was left over and then look at the number of times that we asked for funds to be allocated for policy development. Well, I didn't have any privy to what was left over. I well, just see what we asked for. Right. And and then you said, okay, so if you, and you went back and said, well, if 13 days was paid here and a certain number was paid there, right. then you said 70,000 or some figure was left over. And no, so you're thinking that 43, that's... 6. Okay. Because we asked for $50,000 uh -huh. to cover policy and to cover the rest of the days that Mr. Gorsuch was with us because Mr. Fister's arrival was delayed. That's how it was worded in the video, yeah, in the meeting. Yeah. And that would equate to eight working days. So with those two categories as listed what this $50,000 was going to go to, it was easy to figure out what the eight days of pay was for the I'm CFO. I'm not disputing any of that. So it, I, I just it's the what way the letter through. is written. This is what the community gets. This is what the commissioners post on their website. I actually had to go back and pull the verification that they even got these letters. They generally stamp them um, with a date of receipt when they get them. There is no documentation anywhere that I could find for this one. Um, but there are times where I noticed there was not any correspondence on their agenda. You can pull the correspondence on their agenda up and find our board of letters, board of ed letters, appropriately when we're meeting in front of them asking for transfer, and when a letter goes forward and is just a notification. They still post it in their correspondence. I couldn't find that this letter even ever went to them. I also noticed that that letter was never updated for us because we were still having the old letter that we never approved attached to the agenda. We probably should have brought this in at some point and made it an amendment so that I would have had that. And and you see that um, this right here, th this was definitely earmarked for his pay through May. And but then we ran into Carlo days that we had to what pay him additional dollars. Right, what you're referencing, I know, because you said this is, I just want to be clear, is the $21,600 April 11th was right. the within um, category transfer. Right. And that was explained as 13 days in May and 14 days in, I mean, 13 days in April and 14 days in May. But Sharon, you just said that you had went back and watched the meeting and mm -hmm. we, we said go ahead and yes. send this letter. Yes. Right. We, we gave no, them permission. No, we said you, um, after it was that, updated. With that update. It, in the meeting, right. it was clarified the letter was going to be rewritten. Right. And we get said, the correct numbers on it. And we said if yes. you do that, then go ahead and send it. That's yes, what we said. But, but the commissioners don't have it listed anywhere as a received item, oh. and we never got a copy of it as a replacement item. No, it's nothing. never been attached to our agenda as an amendment. I'm just so bringing you're that they did forward. Not get it. No, I'm not saying they didn't. Okay. I'm saying they haven't posted I'm just it as we having did give received. Them permission. Right. That's what I'm we saying. did. In the we did. Okay. We did. But I don't see anywhere our other documents that we just asked them to be notified of. They appear as a received correspondence from them. I couldn't find this on our end or on their end. That's my point. We approved the rewriting okay. of a letter so with new yeah, Just verbiage. so we know we are not doing anything no, no, no. that we I'm haven't been approved that. to do. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we have got to be as transparent as possible. And 
when we don't give our board a reprinted letter or a rewritten letter or get it attached to an agenda and I have to go back and do some research on something and find that we're still only seeing the old letter that never was approved and the new one never got added. We have to do better than that. So what I'm going to say to you is, I'm, I'm, and I appreciate that, um, the old letter has to be there because that's what was on the agenda. And that's, that's fine. What, and so it has to be there. What I believe occurred, and I'm going from memory, somebody else might have to, and you looked at the video, you looked at the financial documents that were provided for that monthly expenditure and could see what was allocated there and gave us the That's approval. why we did that, yep. And yep. so I, I just want to clarify, that is transparency. So it's not like we pulled these numbers down and weren't sure where they came from or anything like no, that. No, I didn't so say that. So I am happy I to make that. sure that you get this, but that's why the other letter is still there because it's supposed to be there. That's fine. And we were given approval to do that, and that's why we move forward. And this one probably needs to be added as an amendment as the replacement of the one that's there. And so in that case, the board has to make that motion to amend the well, agenda and somebody add. Should, well, then somebody has to provide the board with that letter to start with to be so able to do that. If you have requested that, I'm sure you should get it. I'll make sure that you have it. And moving forward, we need to make sure that we are making the amendments. And that's what the board decides wants to happen. The board did not say that's what they wanted to happen. Anytime we have a document and for whatever reason it's getting rewritten, um, Member George had a real problem with approving that document knowing it was going to be rewritten. We approved the sending of that document as it was rewritten from the financial records we received. Correct. How can we in the future ensure that when that document is created, we as a board get a copy of it and get it into our agenda for an amendment? How about that? That's perfect. We can okay. do that. Okay, so you'll get it to us to get on the agenda to attach to the one that we didn't pass. So it shows, hey, in their meeting they didn't pass this, wonder whatever happened. I don't see a new letter anywhere. I don't see a new letter at the commissioners in their correspondence either. I'm going from the standpoint of a lay person who would try to follow this. Um, don't know why I can't find that within the commissioner's Not paperwork. Sure um, but we definitely need to have it as a historical record in our paperwork. With pleasure. Okay. So when but we get Ms. to Harlow, that, if, mm -hmm. if, if I could, Please. Go, going forward with, with all of the budget transfers I've ever brought to a Board of Education, what you will see will be object level tra uh, transfers that do not require your approval nor county commissioner's approval. So the fact that the $21,600 was moved from contracted services into salaries and wages we didn't have to approve. You it. did not need to approve that. To yes, approve you certainly should have been informed, and then that 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 letter would have then gone over to the commissioners. Well, the letter is what we were asked to approve. Correct. I understand. Not the transfer. Correct. Correct. And then just going forward, just to just kind of clarify process, and that always will happen after the fact because right. we have to go on, we have to do our business, we have to go on and move forward. Right. With things such as categorical transfers, in all of our best work we will make sure that those transfers come to you before it's an unexpected item unless it's an emergency. Those kind of categorical transfers would only be really from part of our end of the year projections or a new legislative thing had come in that was an unfunded mandate. Those kind of things would be done proactively that you would see that. So in the case that it comes to a board meeting and it is not um, in the fashion that you wish, it would be revised and then amended at, at that particular time. So, and then that would require an approval, <coughs> and then that would also require county approval. Correct. So I just wanted to clarify okay. just the kind of two things that you'll be seeing from me going forward. And, and I understand that we can't ever anticipate every expenditure. Um, I've explained this to my constituents when they say, you know, can't you figure out your money better? We have no preview of emergencies. We have no prior knowledge of retirees, uh, people who would retire early unless they've notified us. Someone who may get sick and not be able to come back to work. Those are things that will always affect our budget. Mm -hmm. What I have a problem with is asking the commissioners on the 13th of June to approve transferring a large amount of money for two very distinctive reasons being able to figure out what 
The second one cost, and the first one nowhere near reached that point Understood. in a 17-day period. Understood. I have a clarification I need from you, though. Is when we do send that letter in that's an in-category transfer, you're saying we don't approve that? We approve the letter. No, I know. We don't approve. That in by, turn approves the and transfer. And council's here, but or by the, by law, it is an information item yeah. only. It does we not require pass. board and or <coughs> council <coughs> approval to do in-category object-level transfers. Right, okay. So, and as you've noticed, the last two meetings, it has come to you as for information only. Right. It did not require action. It will require action on a categorical transfer. Right. I got that. that. And that's the way forward. it always was. We would get our financial printout, and it would show those category transfers, and, and there would be a reason why. And if we didn't know it, we could ask, and that Certainly. would be answered. We used to approve the letter. But you used to approve the letter. approve the letter. Right, we did. But it's just for notification purposes to the commissioners. We've made this legal within category transfer in our finance department because that's what our finance department is here to do. Mm -hmm. It's when we get to a out of category transfer that we are required to know to, required to request them to approve that transfer we as a board approve the letter to go to them asking them to approve an out of category transfer i have a real big problem with this fifty thousand dollars that got transferred and now i'm being told it covered a plethora of other things that we didn't know about um, things that actually were questioned on the transfer notification back in April and we were told no none of that I, I've even got my notes from the meeting was any of that for um, Dr. Pearson because apparently that was how it was presented to us on the 11th but then we found out the documentation wasn't correct the dollar amounts weren't correct the verbiage wasn't correct so we pulled that letter back we did approve having a corrected letter sent and now i get to july J june and it says policy improvements and interim chief financial officer for a very short period of time before you could come in in june 1st that's what you said in the video but now i'm seeing pio specialist overrun and who knows what else? I, I just kind of have problems. And when we write these letters for notification only, it seems like we keep carrying over um, the same sentence. Um, we were carrying over to transfer funds allocated for supplies to equipment and to, uh, to purchase additional classroom furniture and the replacement of chairs for staff. That was on April 11th. We had the same verbiage on November 7th. Do we do this on, I'm sorry, on February 7th. Do we do this like every month? Do we buy chairs for staff and every month? Do we buy <coughs> equipment and furniture and so it would be normal to see that in every notification if, or is this just an error that it got cut and pasted? Well, I'm again not privy to exactly what happened those particular months if that happens in that particular month the answer is yes but what we're talking about you're talking a 12-month period and from my records we've got five letters so less than half of the time is any kind of transfer coming to you for approval whether it's in category or out of category so it is it does not happen all the time it's not a standard monthly thing no the it's best not. thing we can do is when we prepare our budget that we do our due diligence and make sure those funds are appropriated where they need to be spent. Okay. But there are things like you had mentioned, emergencies um, and other we things. Um, we don't have you know, any, staff any turnover. Way of documenting that and until it happens. Good fiscal management would leave you with money left over at the end of the year. And then if we realize that we do have money left, coming uh, through a projection leftover money at the end of the year, then maybe perhaps we can come to you with a transfer and says, we have funds here, we would like to do it here to suit this one-time need. And that you will see from us going forward as well. Well, absolutely, because good fiscal management would be indicated by leftover money. Okay. But not when you've asked to move money, large amounts of money, $50,000 into a category, and then you don't use it. Understood. and it's still leftover money that's not good fiscal Understood. management it can be looked at as not being transparent enough to the community that that money was left over we had 17 days to spend it we can't produce any documentation that we did so if 30,000 was left over we way over requested I would agree and and that needs to agree. be thought about in the future Absolutely. so can you help me with the fifth letter the one I'm missing I have one dated in um, no on November 11th and uh, before I'm you sorry, do that hold on just letters. a second four. Mr. Fister my, my 
Mr. Back Fister, up. hold yes, on just one second. Okay. So I just want to go back to the furniture issue. Mm -hmm. So in November, yeah, we did have to purchase furniture, and then we had to purchase furniture again in April. There is no budget for furniture. I know that. And that is a strange thing for a school district. So, yes, you will see that. It's not that it's, you know, every month. You could see that it's not every month. <coughs> but, if Mr. Uh, Pender, if you want to uh, speak to that, we have no budget we for have furniture. No and, and each year I get... We have, okay, Churchill Elementary School has four cafeteria tables now that are beyond repair. So, you know, that's about four to $5,000. Who does? I'm sorry, Churchill? Churchill, Churchill uh -huh. Elementary School. I have to come up with that money and some other allocation to provide those tables that are used 180 days out of the school year. So <coughs> <coughs> we Excuse do me. really need to take a look at that this upcoming year. It's not necessarily to buy furniture to just replace it. It's for damaged furniture that no longer can be used uh, in a safe manner. And, and do we, on a regular basis, replace chairs for staff? Do we do that on a staggering basis, maybe, and that's why it shows up in every transfer? No, we, we or don't. do we do it once a year? He has tried, over no. the years, he has tried to put that as a budget item many times, and it always gets axed. I'll be honest with you, I've seen it many times. Furniture? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because so it's not that? one of the high priorities. In, uh, when so budget. what we did was when we renovated Stevensville and did, built Sellersville Middle School, we used all of that furniture to replace damaged furniture. So that is all gone. I mean, we have really, we try to keep about two or three classrooms of furniture at the warehouse in case there's an emergency. But again, that could be elementary school furniture and the high school needs new chairs for ones that are broke. We also, actually, I was just sending an email to uh, the welding teacher um, at Queens County High School because we take some furniture there for him to fix for us. But again, well, I would never right. question purchasing um, furniture for a classroom, but it just jumped out at me that we asked for replacement chairs for staff every time we sent one of these notification letters. We didn't ask for it as a mm -hmm. with uh, uh, a request November of their approval, but it was in both of the notification announcements. I'm sorry if I could to the April note. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's in instruction, it meant it went to the classroom. So staff could be teachers. The fact that that categorical it's transfer was with an instruction, we it's would not nor could we both. buy office chairs for staff out of the instructional category. It's in both as instruction, both letters it's for students. Yeah, so that would mean it's teachers. Have to go to, towards. It has to That's be right. in the classroom or, or for instructional staff. And okay. something you just, one word you said, there's this notion of, okay, we can have um, furniture or, you know, lunch tables, furniture that can be used in a safe manner. None of us want to see our kids using lunch tables where they could get cut on something or, you know, hurt. So that's a liability. Um, Huge liability. Yeah. So that's a, that, that key word right there um, to the community. I strongly urge that when we go through the budget process this year, it's something that Mm -hmm. We're having a hard time keeping up with, so. Right. Well, and like I said, I would never question um, any furniture we're putting in a classroom or in a school building or anything like that. It just, I honestly thought it was a misprint, that it was just cut and pasted over from the letter before. Maybe it's something that we have to do every three months because we can't do it all at once. So we do it on a regular basis, and it will always show up on these letters. I, I don't know. That's but, why I'm asking these questions. There's no budget for it, so that's why we're asking a transfer. I get that. Right. I get that. So it couldn't be something that we do every three months. We need to put it in the budget. We need an allocation for it. Oh, I have no doubt that we need an allocation in it, for it in the budget. And as Dr. Um, Captain Kelly mentioned, it gets nixed every time because it doesn't get funded. So um, I just think that we need to really examine these requests for transfers because this is really not transparent. I, as a board member, have no idea even now where did this $50,000 go, except that you you're telling tell. me thirty was left over. If I hadn't asked, I wouldn't know that. It, it, it it would be certainly reflected in the finan audited financial statements that we had funds left over. But we will, we will take your, you know, the comments that we've received here moving forward. Um, to the best of my ability, <laughs> you'll see a transfer, a categorical transfer once a year. 
Uh, we need to do our due diligence up front, obviously, like we talked about emergencies, but from the practice that I've put in place and some of the other districts that I've been in, we come to you at the end of the year when we realize we have these savings or these needs, not to budget by <laughs> transfer letters right. and there's and also not, the monthly expenditure report right. yes. so it's, and yes. not get this information not to fund things that we never had enough money in because we're transferring out of another category that has been a big stigma for a long time absolutely it has. and i've sat in these board meetings as a community member and watched the body language and heard the expressions made as these are done in our board meetings here and when they're presented at the commissioner's office and the shaking of the head because it's looked at as um, funny fuzzy accounting and I understand the need to do that but we certainly need to do it a little better if we moved fifty thousand dollars and 17 days later we had 30 left over yes ma'am so real, real quick point. before we move on just to help me out a little bit um, object transfer can mm -hmm. you better can, can you define that so There's object level transfer. transfers are, are there's there's basically five you have salaries mm -hmm. you have contracted services mm -hmm. you have supplies and materials mm -hmm. you have equipment and the reason I skipped one is everything else and then we call that other costs so things such as retirement um, meetings and conferences, uh, mileage for staff, things like that all comes in the other. So if it can't be identified in one of those other four salaries, contracted services, supplies, or equipment, it falls into the category of others. So those are the object levels. And then with underneath of there, that's where we get into the specifics of this is materials of instruction, this is mileage for staff, and things like that. So when you use the word object, you're referring to one of the top Yes, five one of the, the, the higher level of objects. Yes. Just to yes. Understand that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so do we have the contracts for the website work and for the um, policy work? We didn't do a contract for policy work. This is a contract for the website. Okay. Um, and I, I had pulled that back to a page so that uh -huh. you could see oh, okay. the cost. And I'll just read it for everybody. 20 hours at $50 per hour. That's $1,000 per month for five months. Okay. Renewable 30 days. All right, and why don't we have a contract for the policy work? Because it's consultant work. We didn't need a contract. Okay. And do we put those out to bid, or do we not have to? No, nah, for the amount of money that it is, it didn't need to be Well, that's what I'm saying. When we move 10, or perhaps 20, and then another 50 a few months later, all for policy, that's a lot to not have a contract for. But we didn't. We had no intention. Uh, we were asking for additional money because we knew we needed more policy work done, but you can see what we spent was $6,700 approximately. Well, and that brings me to on June 21st, that was a part of the $6,600 bill. We knew it was only $750. We now had a total of $6,627 spent from October to June. Why in the world three days later before that did we ask for $50,000, of which 43 was not Mr. Gorsuch's salary. But we didn't ask, for, we never asked you for $50,000 to do policy work. But that's what was listed, it, policy it was and Mr. Part, Gorsuch. But, right, but it was part of that. But we never asked you for 50000 specifically for policy work. Well, let me read how it read to the commissioners, and then the community kind of will Which understand that you? we have June, that we have, again, some communication problems. We asked to transfer instruction to administration $50,000. The above transfer is requested to cover the cost associated with consulting for policy improvements and service time for the interim chief financial officer. These savings had been, have been generated through the normal process of attrition and the reduction in the cost for meetings. And when you compare that statement to the video of our meeting, and Mr. Fister was here at the time. He said we had some unforeseen days that we had to pay Mr. Gorsuch because of his late arrival. Mr. Fister started on June 1st. So maybe I'm wrong in calculating my days, but I counted eight days of business for Mr. Gorsuch to be paid for. That, according to this letter, leaves $43,600 of this transfer floating around out there that specified for policy improvements, but now I'm being told was used for lots of things and had lots of money left over. 
This was only 17 days before the end of our school year. We should have been better at this calculation. That's my point. Okay, mine is that we didn't spend $50,000 for we policy We shouldn't have asked for it then. We shouldn't have asked We needed for money it. for policy development, but not 50000 This category, which you just read, does not only contain policy improvements. There's I, something else in that. That, and that maybe line. we need to be and somebody's salary and yes a CFO but he had already, equate to what we but he had already been paid for 14 days in May and there was only 22 total so it was eight more days you're going to try to tell me that eight days for Mr. Gorsuch ran into this 43 Mr. Gorsuch earned $800 a day according to all this paperwork eight days of pay at $800 a day is $6,400 that's where I'm getting my $43,600 left and, and do you see what we pay for policy development Nowhere 6, close. 6600 right, That's why I'm asking. Nowhere $800 a day. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. I'm trying to figure out why we asked for Maybe, yeah. so much money with a bill that was so minor. $6,600 was our bill at the time, three days after we asked for this money. $6,600 was our bill. Why did we ask for so much money to be transferred for these two items? I've broken down how much of that was for Mr. Fister. He'd already been paid from the other letter for May What's your and he didn't that, leave that in question. May. What was your response? My response is we needed to do additional policy work. That's why we asked for the funds. Did we get to it? No, we didn't. And you really thought in 17 days we were going to get to $43,600 worth of policy work? No, no. I'm sorry. I'm no, not trying to be no. rude. I'm the majority really of that money this. would have been Mr. Uh, Dr. Gorsuch. The majority of that money would have been Dr. Gorsuch. How it would could that not be? have He'd anywhere been paid. This letter already covered Mr. Gorsuch, Dr. Kane. The, <clears throat> the, the, the video is clear. Mr. Fister explained this letter in detail. You stepped in and explained the 13 days in April and the 14 days in May as being $21,600. And he explained that we thought we would be through with him in May, but we didn't. He ran further into the end of May because he couldn't start till the first. We've already paid for the first 14 school days in May, Mr. F Gorsuch, in this April notification. So when we get to this June request of $50,000, there's only eight, left, eight days left in May. That's all you can attribute to Mr. Gorsuch. The rest, I don't know where it went. That's why I'm asking these questions. And the only thing listed is policy improvement. So this leads me to believe, as a person who doesn't have privy to all of this, even though I'm a board member, I'm no different than a community member reading the same thing, that $43,600 was earmarked for policy. Okay, it might cost that much, but we had no way to spend that on policy work in 17 days. Our school year closed out 17 days later, and now I'm hearing the PIO had to be paid, and we asked about the PIO in this previous letter, and we're told that's why that was written incorrectly, and we had to rewrite it. I'm just saying we've got to be much more transparent to this community at what we're transferring money for and how we're spending it. The end. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be on a rant, but this is really, really important and we're really being eyeballed and we have um, lots of people who do not believe what we tell them. They feel that we are not transparent. I have told them over and over, we are not hiding money. If you sit with us and we open our books, you will understand. When I run across an item that I can't understand, I have to question it. And I'm still not happy with the answer. I'll just, I'll just add that. But that's, I've, I think I've made my point, and I just need to stop. Where would you like to go from here? Um, I'm done. Okay. So, so are we ready? Is. Are there is there other further discussion? Okay. So we will move on to the capital improvement plan. We have Carla Pullen, facilities planner. Good afternoon, board members, Dr. Kane, and executive staff. I'm Carla Pullen, the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. If you will recall, when I was before you last week at the board meeting, we discussed our initial uh, plans for requests for the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2020. These are the requests that we would propose to give to the state for construction projects for the next fiscal year. 
And if you will recall, we talked about the partial roof replacement at Bayside Elementary School, the partial roof replacement at Ken Island Elementary School, a fire alarm replacement at Church Hill Elementary School. And those are the three projects that would be eligible for state funding. So what I would like to do today is open this up for any further discussion or questions that you may have, and then ask you for your approval to submit this document to the state. I don't have any questions because you covered it quite well when you were here before, but the girls might. No, I didn't. I reviewed it again this week, and I don't see any changes, and I especially thank you. on these initial three. I thank you for the packet that you provided us with, too. And thank you. Um, so we need Did a you have anything? No, I don't. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to put forward the letter for the CIP? I move that we forward the CIP. Second. As, as presented at the last meeting. No further discussion? Mm -hmm. I call, oh, you call for the vote. Is it Ms. O'Connor? Um, yes. She, did you second? Oh, yeah, she I, I, I she said second. 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 Sorry. Mm -hmm. She didn't hear. And the vote, um, Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Captain Kelly? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Pollard. Is there any questions or comments before we close the meeting? Um, on the future, future meeting events mm -hmm. there, I just want to um, request that we move the 20th of November to the 19th, um, if that works out on the schedule. And it's listed as the 20th. And the day, next day, there's three days off for the students for Thanksgiving. So. Um, folks that didn't we talk about that the other because day? that's the that's the uh, the 20th is the day right before the Thanksgiving break so the proposal for the 19th would work for my exec team we generally have exec team meetings on that day I would cancel that day so that we could have uh, a board meeting so that would work for us and I just want to make make sure that and she's uh, miss O'Connor's check, check her check her schedule mm -hmm. when she gets well, I'm chance, questioning so. moving it school is open that day we don't go into the school closing till the next day you know we start moving our meetings around our meetings are pretty standard the first Wednesday of every month we did move October because of the MAID conference and that was on the schedule for like a year almost as a change I'm not sure I understand the reasoning behind this one at this late date this is a the Tuesday it's a Tuesday it's not a Wednesday the 20th so, is a Tuesday yes. Because school schools closed, closure, right. and well, you're Wednesday. asking to move it to Monday. To Monday is off. Mm -hmm. And why is that? I'm I'm going out of town. There's people that go out of town. The superintendent said she, uh, when they have meetings right before the holidays, teachers and I mean principals. Oh, you know what? I apologize. Too. I apologize. I, it's a work session. I'm yes. thinking our regular Wednesday no. meeting. Yeah, our meeting. I have no problem. Is, is I'm seven. sorry, Beverly. Okay. I highly apologize. Okay. I thought we were talking about moving our regular Wednesday yeah. night meeting. No. And knowing that that was the last meeting of this current no, board I was, I prior to that. the new members coming in, that's where my line of thinking was. I'm sorry. I missed that it was a uh, school board work meeting. I'm, I'm fine with doing that. Uh, Carrie is next on the line for, for <laughs> I'm approval. Sorry, I'm still trying to log into my, my work and calendar. And so we're it moving it. Well, we're maybe asking Carrie to move it to the 19th. If, if it's okay if with If it's okay with her. her. I got gotcha. you. 11 till 2, correct. Right. 11 till 2 on right. Monday, the 19th. Big time ones. Gotcha. I'm sorry, Beverly. That's okay. Did not realize it was a work session. And talk about the retreat too we right yeah that was my yeah. why she's looking at um okay the, go ahead you know as you recommended last last meeting which was a good recommendation we have brand new people coming in we have a retreat schedule for january also that's right in the middle of our heaviest budget session mm -hmm. lots of meetings probably our first it's, meeting actually right about then mm -hmm. january no january no january 22nd is yeah, the but, retreat, but yeah. what we usually but have, yeah, yeah. So our first work session is delete that and then move it to a future 16. date. That I, I totally agree with that. that. Um, we actually have a meeting on the 16th and a meeting on the 30th for work budget work. Um, I, I think we need to let our elected mm -hmm. members have a little time to acclimate themselves and get comfortable speaking to us and to issues. 
So I highly recommend the, the move to late May or early June. Because they're going to have quite a bit of orientation they are, to do. On they their are. They'll be overloaded they are. with meetings. So. Absolutely. Um, is late May, early June a good time, do you well, think? Well, we can look at what she's coming up with for an idea. For so late May, early June is graduation time for yeah, us. That's true. We're still testing. Mm -hmm. So what we, I'd propose to do is, is uh, once the new board members come on board, then we can you know, work with them on a date that might be agreeable okay. uh, to everybody. So okay. we'll maybe revisit that in April? Yeah, maybe March, April. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't think we should ask them that soon to even think about a date. I let, let, let's let them kind of get their feet on the ground. Yeah. We'll revisit it in, in, in April. Carrie, how are you for the 19th? So the 19th is fine. And then just to, to add on to one more thing, um, a, a thought about using uh, Board of Education rather than school board on our materials. I notice even our agenda as we're going through these dates. Um, point to school board, school board, school board. Um, I'm just wondering if we could switch some of that language over to Board of Education. That becomes so confusing for the community. Some community members think the Board of Education central office and employees and staff are what is referred to every time somebody says Board of Ed. And other people think Board of Ed is just the members. Mm -hmm. So we are the school board. We are also the Board of Ed, but the Board of Ed also includes our executive team. Okay, I just wanted so, to see. I, I don't know. I've touched on this before in my time on the board and just wanted gotcha. to, not to pull off the date. Although the executive team is always in our meetings. The, the date. Um, situation so but you're right the school the executive team is a part of all these meetings too so it could say board of education this, yeah what you, do you're, you're the I... school board so and, and it's a retreat we'll be there yes but you are the school board and so that's why it says that so it probably is is okay to leave it throughout uh, she's saying throughout I, I just kind of meant everywhere we we're just sort of saying school board um school board meeting school board meeting uh didn't know if there's a reason for that if you know, there was discussion prior. It is a school versus, board meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the 19th is fine. Okay, <laughs> Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you for changing that. <clears throat> End of discussion. Any questions? Everyone ready for um, a motion to adjourn? Move that we close the meeting, adjourn the meeting. Mm -hmm. Second. Thank you very much. Um, oh, we have to vote. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. 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 Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Mm -hmm.